Welcome, and thank you for participating today. My name is Lori Hintz, and I am a program manager from Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, working with Nursing Home Quality Improvement in South Dakota. Crystal Hayes, my colleague from Nebraska, um, is going to be helping monitor the chat, keeping items to review. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted within seven days on our website at www.greatplainsqin.org. All lines will be muted throughout this presentation. The chat box is located and they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. If time does not allow us to answer all the questions, we will be sure and get back to you the answers from PEG post the webinar. So let's get on with the webinar. Today's webinar is the top 10 counts and it's sponsored by Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, serving Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Ted Gilbert is our speaker today. She's the owner of Quality IC. The focus of her business is to improve infection prevention practices in healthcare facilities and is sharing her knowledge gained from over 40 years as a healthcare professional. She recently authored a course on becoming a safe injection champion as part of a CDC grant awarded to the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. She is a faculty member for APEC Educational Course Human Services. She is a faculty member for APEC Educational Courses and has completed many infection control assessments in long-term care and acute care facilities. Peggy has a master's degree in nursing with an emphasis in adult education from Creighton University. Creighton University. She is certified in infection control and was in the first group to be named as an APEX fellow. We're very happy to have Peg here with us and I turn the presentation over now to Peg. Well, thank you and thank Thank you, uh, Great Plains Quality Privilege of visiting 32 nursing homes uh, in the Great Plains area over the last uh, two years and uh, got a pretty good look of what's going on throughout the area and our wonderful Midwest uh, uh, territory. And so today, Lori asked me what I saw in doing all these assessments that we can take back to our facilities and make sure that we've implemented the standards for best practice. And one of the things I like to do whenever I'm speaking the most is to give you a bunch of resources because a lot of times it's hard to remember everything that a speaker says. Uh, then I know where to find the information. So let's go ahead and get started with, uh, and we'll go backwards starting with number 10. It is antibiotic stewardship. The number 10 one was a priority item, simply be item, simply because in phase two of the new long-term care regulations, it required that in November 2017, you begin the development of an antibiotic stewardship program. We know that antibiotics are one of the most frequently prescribed medications in nursing homes, and 70% of our residents receive one or more patients in nursing homes, and 70% of our residents receive one or more courses in a, over a year's time. However, a large variety of them, a large majority of them, may be unnecessary or inappropriate, and we know that they can be very harmful. So, the ones of the top 10 to talk about resources because there are being so many good things that are being developed to assist uh, putting in a very good antibiotic stewardship program in your facility. We know that the core elements for antibiotic stewardship in nursing homes that were developed by the CDC is definitely a that you implement these particular strategies. And there's a good checklist in order for you to see how well you're meeting the requirements for this. Also, AHRQ has an excellent toolkit, uh, and I mentioned the CDC assessment materials, but there's very good assessment materials, but there's very good information on the Great Plains, on your very own Great Plains Quinn QIO website about antibiotic stewardship and long-term care. I encourage you to look at these in order to get a good start on your program. 
All right, good start on your program. All right, number nine. Number nine is cleaning of shared patient items. I've spent a lot of time going over this particular topic in, in several homes. When we're talking about commodes and your electronics and gate belt patient or resident to resident um, and need to be cleaned in between, and are we sure that they're being cleaned in between? When we look at things, we have to decide whether they are fitting in one of three categories, whether they are a non-critical item, which the things we're talking about nine are mainly non-critical items. They're, con they're items that will not come in contact with mucous membranes or skin that is not intact. All these are going to be contaminated with some microorganisms. I mean, you look in uh, your rehab areas and the uh, bikes that are used for walking or weights and things like that. They're used from person to person. We need a germicide that's going to kill bacteria, just regular bacteria, fungi, and also some of the easier killed viruses. Uh, that's on the slide is a listing of the things I'm talking about. But overall, the, overall, these things just need low-level disinfection. So it's not that most everyone doesn't have an appropriate cleaner for these particular items. It's just making sure that they're cleaned in between uh, resident to resident and making sure that there's a process so that that cleaner is readily available and making sure that there's a process so that that cleaner is readily available in order to get staff compliance, in order for it to be clean between, clean between people. Now, I want to caution you because it was pretty much on the hunt everywhere I went to look for the dreaded nail clippers. Um, they, um, they seem to be stashed. Uh, usually, almost everywhere I went, there were some that were loose. Now, these are not considered anymore to be a uh, non-critical care item because, especially in the elderly, when you're trimming fingernails or especially toenails that are more exposure. And just because of the design of nail clippers, they cannot be adequately disinfected because they have too many little crevices and places that if you just use a general wipe, you're never going to get to them. So those have now been designated as semi-critical items, and they require high-level disinfection items, and they require high-level disinfection. So um, in order to look at this, uh, one of the things that I wanted to give you is what is uh, a tool in order to ev evaluate your disinfectants. And this is just simply evaluate your disinfectants. And this is just simply a, a little form that if you're looking for a different disinfecting and disinfectant and not feeling comfortable about what you have, to look at their what it's going to kill, how long it takes for it to kill, the organisms that you want, how toxic is it to the individuals that were using it? I was in one facility and they had chosen to go to all bleach products. And I can tell you that the poor housekeeper, um, I, in fact, I thought there was something wrong with her because tears were streaming down her face. And, uh, because, and uh, so we need to be careful about the products that we're using and if they could be harmful to our staff how easy it is to use, and what it takes in order to maintain them. So when you look at the cleaning solutions, we need to make sure that they're prepared uh, correctly. Uh, in your cleaning solution, if you're using a dispenser, then you're going to use for just daily cleaning and discard any remaining solution, and then let that container dry out over the night. Um, dispose of the used solutions immediately to avoid them from becoming a reservoir because even though they are a cleaner, that doesn't have harbor bacteria. And just be careful about the containers you use. Look on the bottle and make sure it doesn't have a guideline that says that this container cannot be reused because it is paramount that we follow manufacturer's guidelines. And uh, we have to make sure manufacturer's guidelines. And uh, we have to make sure that, that uh, especially chemicals are disposed of correctly and that solutions are used the way that they are meant to be used. We have to follow the directions in order for them to work. 
um, to work. Um, for example, we, ha uh, we have to look at how long the solution has to sit on the item in order for it to kill the things it says it's going to kill. Uh, and you have to use it correctly or use enough of the solution so it stays wet during the flu in order to kill the organism. So if it has a kill time, a wet time of three minutes, it has to stay wet on that surface for a whole three minutes. And then you can let it air dry. So that's what you need to be careful about with your containers of wipes, that the lid is always down on them so that they don't dry out early, so that you end up having to throw them away. Of course, checking the expiration dates, but also help your housekeeping uh, personnel, because I asked a lot of them if they understood what wet time meant, and several of them were not sure, or else they were using understood what wet time meant, and several of them were not sure, or else they were using a spray bottle and immediately wiping the solution off before, uh, so it wasn't wet at all um, when they were cleaning. Cleaner labeling is uh, simply a safety. The employer is not required to label portable containers into uh, which hazardous chemicals are transferred if either it's going to be under the immediate use of the employee that's going to do the cleaning. If it's going to be kept from person to person, then it does have to be labeled and uh, OSHA has some, uh, and how those containers have to be labeled and they have to be easily read. We need to make sure that our cleaning is effective, and this is just uh, something I put in here. Uh, visual assessment is not a reliable uh, indicator of surface cleanliness, and that if you can possibly uh, use some fluorescent, a good teaching tool for your staff uh, for daily cleaning to make sure that they're getting to those areas that need to be cleaned. It's really important in the nursing home environment that we standardize the cleaning process. They need a good checklist on what should be cleaned uh, because uh, uh, in, in order to have adequate staff of the different people who are doing the cleaning. So we need to make it very easy to orient new people into the facility, uh, develop a resource teaching tool is a best practice, take a picture of every item to be cleaned, teaching tool is a best practice, take a picture of every item to be cleaned, assign responsibility of who's going to clean that, note, note the frequency and the method of cleaning, what type of product you use in order to clean it. And once you've got it done, which it can be a task in order to get done initially, then it's got it done, which it can be a task in order to get done initially, then it's easy just to update, and it just makes a great teaching tool um, as uh, personnel begin uh, in your different areas. Here's some resources for cleaning uh, and for you, uh, these two pictures. These are a couple of pictures I took in, in a couple of your facilities that were just best practices. What they had decided to do was uh, make these little baskets uh, for each individual person. So their patient care items and their the dreaded clippers were in each of these each of these baskets. Uh, one place they were on a cart. One other place they had adequate shelving in their uh, tub room, so they were readily there when uh, to be used and returned and kept separated from individual to individual from individual to individual. Okay, going on to number eight. The winner of number eight is the hand hygiene program. The issue is that um, a lot of places were in a little bit of monitoring of uh, hand hygiene in their facility. But one of the requirements or best practices for a hand hygiene program is it needs to be monitored, first of all. So that means you need to do some auditing. But also, you need to do a competency assessment along with hygiene as a skill. And if you ask people to do it in front of you, 
there's a lot of different practices you will see being done. And so that's why a competency assessment was something uh, that you can put on a person's hands and have them wash their hands and use a, a hand is a really good tool in order to know whether this is being done correctly. Um, a lot of places didn't, uh, the availability supplies were lacking, especially adequate number of alcohol hand rub uh, dispensers. Uh, I saw a lot of, uh, of uh, retail type. Uh, these really need to not be in healthcare facilities because a lot of them, because of their perfumes and dyes and things like that in them, and some of their other products are not compatible with your gloves. And so um, that was one thing we need to educate our staff about not bringing those educate our staff about not bringing those things in from home. Some places were topping off their alcohol hand rub and their soap. Uh, this is a very dangerous process to to be done because that um, allows that soap that's in there to sit and it will gather organisms and in there to sit and it will gather organisms and you will actually be doing more harm than good with your hand hygiene. A lot of artificial nails uh, out there, remember that's not a good practice because uh, of the crevices that the nails create in order to be able to, uh, but you need to do whatever your policy reflects. Uh, hand hygiene is a frequent citation, and uh, so it's something that you really need to look at. This is a long-term care hand hygiene requirement. You need to have a written standard policy and procedure for the program, and you need to say when you're going to wash your hands and when they aren't. I also provided you with a slide simply because a lot of you were really interested in increasing your alcohol hand rub. Now well, that's the recommended number one form of hand hygiene, in, with the exception in situations of outbreak of C. diff, with the exception in situations of outbreak of C. diff, or visibly soiled. So um, these are the rules on where those dispensers can be located. So we need to know why people are not washing their hands correctly, and these are some things that were found in a study correctly, and these are some things that were found in a study as to why hand hygiene compliance is not very good, and a lot of it has to do with infective placement of dispensers or things, um, and uh, that they just don't feel like it's really that necessary, or they're wearing gloves all the time in their hands. And so we do need to do more education only um, on this subject, even though it seems like uh, we can be a broken record on that. If you have a process for care of your resident rooms, walk that process and make sure that you've got dispensers readily available so that we don't have any. And a couple of times I've recommended those two facilities that just didn't either didn't even have them or were just carrying them in pockets and things like that. Um, give your staff uh, just a little card of little dots that are used sometimes to put prices on rummage sales and have your staff carry them for a couple of days wish that they would have had an alcohol hand rub dispenser. Get your staff involved in the, the project and, uh, uh, and then follow through. Where you've got a lot of dots on the wall, give them an the alcohol hand rub dispenser as long as you're under the number that you can have within a fire zone. And, uh, uh, and then you have the ability to hold accountability for, for that process. A hand hygiene station has to have soap and paper towels. Uh, it's best if the faucet is offset from the drain. That's a new guideline. Uh, not going to see that process from the drain. That's a new guideline. Uh, not going to see that probably for a while other than new construction. But one thing that's important is that splash zone clearance, that three feet clearance from sink of patient care supplies. I saw a lot of stuff that was right next to sinks. And remember that, remember that trap, drain traps especially harbor gram-negative bacteria, which is the most dangerous bacteria to our residents. And so when that gets aerolized, then it comes and falls on those supplies that then are taken into a resident room and becomes a source of contaminated storage. And just look at the 
um, how your sinks, the construction of them are working. I especially looked at that in your beauty salon areas because uh, it just because of the chemical processes and stuff they use in order to dye hair or permanence, uh, those sinks get corroded. And when they are corroded, location is really important uh, where you put um, soap dispensers and alcohol hand rub uh, so that uh, you, they don't get confused. They shouldn't be side by side. Uh, and they need to be similar throughout the institution so it become more of a, a ball. Choosing a hand hygiene product, these are, these are some uh, tips in order to choose a good one for you. And again, on artificial nails and jewelry, make sure that you have a clear policy so that people understand that from the day of hire on what the expectations, day of hire on what the expectations are. Uh, and uh, so that you can enforce it. Here's some resources. Here's a hand hygiene assessment uh, that the National Nursing Home uh, Consortium has available. And Consortium has available. And this is an audit tool, and I, I particularly like this audit, hand hygiene audit tool simply because it's got this section on possible contributing factors to failure to wash. So you can do an audit, but you don't just fix. And that's what I like about this particular audit tool because it says, why didn't they uh, wash their hands or use alcohol hand rub when they were supposed to? Well, their hands were full of supplies. Uh, there wasn't a dispenser anywhere near. The dispenser was empty. Uh, it helps you know what to fix. Seven, the medication room. What is the issue with the medication room? Excessive supplies. There are so much stuff in so many medication uh, rooms. Uh, supplies were in that splash zone that I just talked about. Supplies were in that splash zone that I just talked about. Supplies on the floor, purses, a lot of personal items. Uh, refrigerators, specimen refrigerators, food, um, sharps disposal uh, containers that were not secured. They weren't on the wall. They were just sitting uh, while they were just sitting uh, open on a uh, countertop. And one thing that you really need to think about is what is the routine for cleaning that room? That's usually a secure area in most of our facilities. And so the door is locked. So the housekeepers do not have access to get in there. So, and uh, it doesn't get clean routinely like the rest of our facility. So there needs to be a real plan to make sure that that is regularly clean. Because the medication room is considered a clean area. It should be well lit, refrigerator with a temperature log, no food. It has to have, uh, it has to have a hand hygiene station. Nothing on the floor. It has to have a secured sharps container and uh, need to be storing unused supplies and medications in a clean area separate from any used uh, equipment. And make sure that you aren't unwrapping any sterile equipment. And make sure that you aren't unwrapping any sterile supplies uh, and just storing them in that way. Otherwise, you don't know what is clean and what is dirty and it contaminates those items. I just want to make a mention because I see an awful lot of these dormitory style refrigerators and some of those are okay, but they are not okay if you're storing vaccines in them. Vaccines need special refrigerators that have uh, what we consider pharmacy grade uh, refrigerators in order to make sure that that temperature is controlled very carefully. A really good one like that, and then uh, have these other types of refrigerators and other areas. Vaccine storage uh, needs to be large enough to store the inventory, and it needs to be stored in the middle of the refrigerator where there's the most stable temperature. Uh, that log needs to be kept very carefully, change the temperature of that log. A few times when I saw that those were out of the recommended temperature, people would just crank up the temperature. Well, that's not the approved process for changing temperatures. In a uh, in vaccines can be very fragile. Um, the, the 
temperature changed and then checked in 30 minutes and, uh, and then monitored very carefully. Temperature monitoring devices need to be ones that uh, show the temperature at the exact time that they're read is the recommendation of the CDC. And why I get recommendation of the CDC and why I get concerned about this is there were a few times when people said that, that uh, well, that year the flu vaccine didn't work for us at all. Well, my first thought that came to mind was, I wonder if your vaccine was any good. And part of that is was, was I wonder if your vaccine was any good. And part of that is, was it stored correctly, that it didn't get too hot, that it didn't freeze, that it had become inactivated. So there's a very good toolkit on the CDC website that has best practices for storing your vaccine. Make sure you have uh, supplies in the bedroom. Nobody has enough room that I saw in anyone's uh, facility. That putting up a splash guard in order to make sure that that, uh, that splash from the drains isn't getting over onto your um, supplies. Okay, and linens. Laundry and linens. The issue is um, the soiled laundry area and the sorting of that was always a place where we usually went to kind of first because uh, those uh, employees usually come to work early and uh, get their work done and, and leave early, early and uh, get their work done and, and leave early. So it was one of the first places that we went uh, to talk about uh over 50%, I'm sure, of all the facilities I went to had issues with prote personal protective equipment in the laundry. Uh, the person in the soiled laundry, uh, the person in the soiled laundry area did not understand that um, gowns are a single-use item. Uh, once they put them on and sort, then that gown has to be removed and washed or disposed of, depending on the type of gown and a clean one put on, hung on a hook behind the door and saved for the next time. And so that is something to be sure and check. The other thing that soiled laundry areas tend to be hot. And so I saw a lot of fans in soiled laundry areas. Those really need to be monitored because it's important to clean area through the soil, to the soiled area so that you are not blowing any air from the soiled area into your clean area um, because then you're contaminated. All that hard work and all that good, nice, clean laundry that you've processed. So really watch to make sure that there is a sharp disposal box in your soiled laundry so that there's a close place if they do find any sharp item in the laundry to dispose of it. And that's an OSHA regulation. And there shouldn't be any red bags in the laundry. And uh, we'll talk about that and uh, we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. So uh, in the laundry area, there needs to be a designated clean and dirty area, that airflow from clean to dirty. Uh, they need to have personal protective equipment when sorting and rinsing and never reusing it. Uh, that linen sorting and rinsing and never reusing it. Uh, that linen needs to be sorted by the degree of soil and the fabric type. Uh, we mentioned the sharps container. They need to have a way to wash their hands. And regular cleaning of those folding tables and carts that are used to move the linen. And those folding tables are made of a non-porous surface. So I saw a lot of wooden tables. Uh, metal stainless steel tables are definitely a lot better. Um, remember, wood, any sort of wood, uh, that varnish, that surface gets gouged and that's a harboring place for organisms and try to get that changed as soon as possible. Washing machines need to be left empty at the end of the day with the door open so that they have a chance to dry out and not um, stay damp inside of there in that dark, damp environment. And we need to transport the, the linen covered with a solid bottom car and we need to transport the, the linen covered with a solid bottom cart. Remember when you're handling linens uh, that it is, that all soil linen is considered contaminated. So we really need to make sure that when they're stripping a bud, they aren't shaking, 
that when they're stripping a bud, they aren't shaking it, they aren't pulling that against their scrubs or their uniform, contaminating it. We need to contain that uh, soiled laundry in a laundry bag. If it's wet at all, it needs to be into an impervious bag. So ever, um, and no more linen brought into the resident room than is going to be used because any unused linen, once it is brought into the room, has to be considered contaminated. It cannot be used in another area. So the one that has probably uh, been budding to people is the requirement, OSHA requirement, to sort and rinse linen only in the laundry area and not on patient care areas. Uh, this is because how many times have you seen uh, those of you that are rinsing linen in the hopper in a patient care area, that, that your employees are linen in the hopper in a patient care area, that, that your employees are using personal protective equipment. They aren't, and that's why this regulation came about, and uh, it is for the protection of your employees that you have that process uh, changed so that all uh, change so that all rinsing is done in your soiled laundry area where they have PPE. It needs to be transported in separate carts for soiled and, and uh, clean. Uh, if you don't have separate carts, then you need to show that they're thoroughly cleaned and disinfected in between, transported back to the patient care areas in a covered cart. Uh, and that includes if you're doing resident clothing, uh, if you're sending resident items, because I know there's some families that like to do the laundry for their uh, loved one, uh, send it home in a bag. Uh, just make sure that it's a different bag. And uh, if you do have laundry chutes in your facility, those must, all linen must be bagged, and there needs to be a policy on how those uh, chutes are maintained. Storage of linen is definitely part of this particular item. Uh, there has to be a physical room. It has to be covered if it's out of the room, uh, not in a designated closet with the door closed. Of course, nothing on the floor. Bottom shelf has to be up uh, off of the floor so that there can be cleaning underneath of it and uh, keeping the um, linen, away, um, linen away from the ceiling so that there's ventilation, lights, sprinklers, that sort of thing. But nothing else stored in a room unless that linen is on a covered cart and then you've got shelves with other things on it. Here's your resources for uh, OSHA guidance on laundry and linen. Here's your resources for uh, OSHA guidance on laundry and linen. And also that laundry rule, just because I get so many questions about it, Contaminated laundry shall be bagged or containerized at the location where it was used and not be sorted or rinsed in the location of use. All right. Number five is personal protective equipment use and disposal. All right. What was the issue? Overuse of red bags. Uh, red bags should never have linen in them. Uh, the visual cue of red bags is whatever goes on away. So first of all, linen should never be red bags. Um, and then we need to look at the things that are going into red bags. Red bags can be uh, a very expensive um, item in order for waste disposal. So we need to use them when we need to, but not overuse them. We need to use them when we need to, but not overuse them. Uh, so that was one of the issues we saw, and we'll talk more about it, uh, that your personal protective equipment was always not set up and readily available whenever isolation was needed for an individual. The signage was needed for an individual. The signage was unclear of what PPE is needed. Um, not everyone had PPE at entrances for visitors and family. And uh, there should be a competency assessment to make sure that all of your new employees and ongoing all your employees know how to use the PPE. So supplies immediately available. I know uh, your isolation cart needs to be resupplied and ready for use. Uh, I know in one facility it was over an hour before we could find the isolation cart. Uh, they shouldn't be locked in the maintenance man's closet. 
uh, where the staff can't get to it 20 and it needs to make sure that it is resupplied, ready for use uh, when, when you need it. Your signs need to uh, be a visual clue as to what personal protective equipment is used. That way, if any anyone has difficulty reading or there's language issues, uh, difficulty reading or there's language issues, uh, they can look at the pictures and know what they need to do in order to be safe. So those, supply, those signs need to be meaningful. Appropriate glove use. Um, well, that's something I've been talking about in a lot of areas. Uh, appropriate areas, uh, appropriate glove use is uh, more that what we've developed into is overuse of gloves rather than underuse. And so we need to make sure that we're educating uh, when gloves are necessary. They need to be used with standards whenever there's the likelihood of of contact with blood or body fluids. So uh, it doesn't say all the time or every time we walk in the door, we need to make sure that we're washing our hands before we put them on and when we take them off and, uh, and uh, not to touch other surfaces, that they don't just come on and then they stay on the whole time you're in that room, no matter what you do, and then are removed when they come out. Uh, need to have the correct type and size available, and uh, they're the last thing that goes on. I've uh, shared this for the last thing that goes on. I've uh, shared this particular um, World Health Organization glove information leaflet simply because it's got the section down here, gloves not indicated except for uh, contact precautions on uh, direct patient exposure when you're, when you're taking a blood pressure, temperature and pulse, performing sub-Q or IM injections, and bathing and dressing the patient, uh, transporting, all those different things. So it's a good tool to help your staff need to know that they don't need to be using gloves all the time. This is always a kind of exercises, again, the WHO best practice. Uh, when you're giving insulin injections, um, you don't need to wear gloves. But make sure, though, that your policy reflects that, that standard, that you're following the WHO recommendation. Where to dispose of your PPE? The patient room in the general trash, gowns in the regular trash before leaving the room. Your, if you use a mask, it should be outside the room if it's an airborne precaution. Red bag your personal protective equipment only if it is dripping body fluids. And if you review the CDC isolation. All right, number four is mold. Mold uh, reproduces through the formation of spores. When spores land on suitable moist surfaces, they begin to grow and release chemicals that digest and eventually digest and eventually destroy the surface and the underlying material. So the issue is, and those of you that had drop down ceilings, uh, I frequently saw wet or stained ceiling tiles, uh, under sink cabinet leaks, um, and things stored under sinks, cabinet leaks, um, and things stored under sinks so that uh, you didn't know whether you had any leaking going on or not. And in a few places, um, ceiling tiles that were painted to cover up the stains. And uh, that is a cosmetic, cosmetic thing that said, what I use kills. Well, kills still only gets on the surface. It does not uh, get rid of the mold on the other side of the ceiling tile. So we need to discard all water damaged materials, uh, especially if we see anything that's wet for more than 48 hours, it should be discarded. And that includes carpet, upholstery, wallpaper, uh, floor and ceiling tiles, clothing. And under sink storage, you know, several places either don't have it available just that way that they've done their construction, or they have it available just that way that they've done their construction, or they lock it, lock the door so nothing gets stored there. But things can be stored under a sink, so long as it's something that can't mold. 
uh, say, a plastic bottle uh, item, that type of thing that doesn't mold. But definitely no thing that doesn't mold. But definitely no linen, no paper, anything like that, that if it gets wet, it gets soggy and molds. Here's your CDC guidance on this topic, and the EPA is really uh, has great concerns about it too. Number three is the requirement for a water management plan in long-term care facilities. This is a new requirement, uh, but we're seeing a huge increase in the amount of Legionella. Uh, we have a very vulnerable population. Uh, that Legionella pneumonia uh, is uh, something that is occurring in a lot of the residents in long-term care. 19% of outbreaks in Legionella have occurred in long-term care, and 9% of these cases are fatal. Uh, and so it's required that you develop a water management plan, and you can see, uh, and so it's required that you develop a water management plan, and you can see what it does to an individual's lungs on this picture. What I saw were a lot of unused water sources for prolonged period of time, and this is a really a danger uh, that that's a place that's going to harbor Legionella that, uh, and that's going to grow within those pipes. And the next time you, you do turn on that sink or that bathtub or wherever it was, it's going to aerolize Legionella out into the environment. And it's a really ha real hazard to your residents and to your employees is there's a very good CDC Legionella toolkit and uh, that you can begin the assessment. Uh, but eliminate those outlets if you're certain it's never going to be used. You know, a lot of the hoppers, a lot of sinks that I saw in what had been closets that had been turned into just general and closets that had been turned into just general supply rooms, uh, those things weren't being used anymore. Uh, eliminate it. Uh, or repurpose the outlet to something that you do need, some other type of sink. If you can't do either one of those, uh, for example, I saw a couple of facilities. You can't do either one of those. Uh, for example, I saw a couple of facilities that they were uh, remodeling. They were uh, ripping out carpet and weren't using a wing for a period of time, or they closed down a wing uh, for uh, due to census. And, but all those wearing appliances uh, need to be maintained. And so uh, once a week, if you just go uh, assign someone to do what we call Water Wednesday and just turn on all those outlets uh, for a couple of minutes, flush the toilet, just get that water moving through it so that it's stagnant. There are uh, low-cost sensors to tell where a faucet, faucet is being used or not and indicate when it needs to be flushing. Uh, but this, uh, that and a point-of-use filter on the faucet uh, is also an option, but those are cost items. Um, you would also an option, but those are cost items. Um, you would only want to put those filters on faucets if it's something that's very rarely used because those filters are expensive. All right, number two is injection safety and disposal. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart uh, because we want to make sure that, uh, that we are not passing on bloodborne pathogens from resident to resident. And uh, uh, it's difficult to know when that happens because one time uh, if a mistake or a reometer occurs, we may not know for a year or years um, that something was passed on that particular day. So I did see a lot of glucometers that were shared between residents with variable cleaning processes. Uh, if I asked a staff member, how do you clean your glucometer, uh, I got various different answers. Uh, and uh, But the, the right answer is, well, first of all, is this a glucometer that can be used uh, from resident to resident because some glucometers should only be used by single uh, person and those shouldn't even be in the facility by single uh, person and those shouldn't even be in the facility. Uh, if they don't have guidelines for cleaning, then they cannot be shared. 
So a shared glucometer needs to be clean using the manufacturer's directions for use, and it needs to be an EPA-registered product. So it can't be alcohol, and it needs to be an equivalent product um, for cleaning that has been tested with the item. We need to make sure that medication pens are labeled, uh, labeled on the pen itself and not the barrel, because barrels and the pens can become separated. Pen is used for each patient, so resident, so that they use, so they look just exactly the same. So you don't want to store them in the same container inside your medication cart. Uh, because it's too easy then to pick up the wrong one, uh, but, and they should be stored without the needle on so that that needle is not painters unsecured. And again, why, why uh, OSHA has that requirement of secured uh, sharps containers is because you don't want to be walking or bump a sharps container and it will open up or uh, syringes would then spill out and potentially so uh, single-use lancets, I didn't see anybody who wasn't doing that. So that's really good that you are not. But as I said before, those blood glucose meters, if they must be shared, best practices do not share them, have enough of them that you do not, uh, but that they are not, uh, but that they are cleaned and disinfected every time with an EPA-registered dis disinfectant. And there should be a competency assessment uh, that those are being used and disinfected correctly uh, from your staff. Insulin pens, as I mentioned, uh, from your staff. Insulin pens, as I mentioned before, are, are for single use. You're going to see more medication pens as uh, time goes forward uh, in, in use for a lot of different types of medications. And here's some resources. Uh, and, line and the one and only campaign. And if you want to know more about safe injections, I encourage you. This is a course that I wrote on becoming a safe injection champion. Uh, you would get uh, one hour of continuing education and gives all the principles that we've been talking about. All right, to the next item, and it's number one, storage of supplies. Inappropriate items stored together is the issue, the bottom shelf height, uh, lack of solid bottoms, and external shipping containers were the issue. External shipping containers were the issue. So bottom shelf height is always an issue because you need to be able to clean underneath that bottom shelf without splashing your supplies that are above it. So when there's just an inch or two, uh, from the bottom shelf, you can't get a mop in there. And if you look, get a mop in there. And if you look down in there, you see a lot of dust, a lot of dirt, uh, insects, all kinds of things that are supposedly in a clean room. And and I think this uh, picture here is good to show inappropriate items stored to closet like this that's full of all kinds of things on the floor, uh, clutter and uh, not kept so that they are clean. Remember, that's what we use after we wash our hands. External shipping containers. We need to remove the supplies from external shipping containers, get that cardboard out of ability that has contacted the outside uh, of the semis that delivered your supplies. So inside those semis are very dirty. Uh, a lot of our products in the nation are being hauled across country and in semis, and they harbor dust and in semis, and they harbor dust, bacteria, and insects. The corrugated cardboard is just a wonderful place for bugs in order to hibernate, and uh, then when they get in your nice warm facility, they'll hatch and you'll have a, a very difficult time getting rid of them. So what is the process to follow? Supplies and equipment, best is eight inches from the floor, solid liner on the bottom shelf of something that is uh, wipeable, so that would not be uh, cardboard or anything paper. Plastic tubs are always good uh, protection, and there can't be any linen in these types of storage items. 
uh, storage closets because these are for supplies. This was really a nice, uh, nice storage room. Contained a lot of stuff, but it was stored quite well. Here's some re here's some resources on storage. Uh, about shipping containers that uh, uh, using uh, cardboard in facilities and making sure that clean or sterile items are removed uh, before they are brought into your facility in order to make sure that you aren't bringing or brought into your facility in order to make sure that you aren't bringing in uninvited guests. All right, so we are to the end of the top 10 summary of items that I talked about almost every time and were in several of your action plans and hopefully gave you some resources that those of you that I didn't travel to your facility can take a look, walk around your facility. Since these were so commonly seen, are these issues that would help you improve your infection control plan? And I just want to thank all the friendly faces that my to uh, meet uh, as he drove me over 10,000 miles uh, in in the state uh, to visit all the different facilities, uh, had saw so many beautiful sites and uh, and most of all beautiful people in the facilities that I visited. Beautiful people in the facilities that I visited. So again, thank you for inviting me into your facility, and I hope this information will uh, make your practices safer for your residents and your staff. At this point in time, I'd be willing to take any of your questions. Any of your questions. Thanks, Ted. Great presentation with such practical, down-to-earth tips that we can use today. Uh, I did gather a couple of questions. There's quite a bit of chat going on, but hand sanitizers, dispensers in the in long-term care because of the danger to patients. Our staff is supposed to carry individual hand sanitizer bottles with them, but I still feel that if it is mounted on the walls like it is in our hospital, compliance would be better. What are your thoughts? That's a great question. Uh, I really... Uh discourage uh, bottles and pockets, except in the in a true dementia unit where you don't have surveillance of of uh, patient residents and and what they might be doing and any way and and what they might be doing and any way they can get into things quite quickly and don't know the difference. But I think there's been plenty of <clears throat> facilities that have found if they do a risk assessment of their hand hygiene, of their alcohol hand rub containers, they can make the case that there's enough staff down those hallways or the line of sight from where they are at that there are not prolonged periods of time where those uh, alcohol hand rub dispensers are not uh, are not seen. Most of the design of the alcohol hand uh, dispensers, it's very difficult for residents to even figure out how to use them if they have memory issues. And uh, so they they just have not been proven to be a source where they can um, uh, get enough that is toxic to them. Um, but I do see the uh, alcohol hand rub pumps and stuff in locked containers in, in a separate dementia care area. And along those same lines, um, another person com same lines, um, another person commented that they have the hand sanitizers mon mon mounted, excuse me, on the walls in their facility. But when, but while assisting residents with eating, they were told they could not have hand sanitizers. I know that that, that is question not a lot. Mm -hmm. I get uh, that that question comes up to me a lot. The requirement yeah. for not for using um, soap and water is for food preparation areas. The dining room is not a food preparation area, and that uh, actually it's a best practice that you 
when the resident is, um, say, coming into the dining room, that you assign one staff member there to either uh, give them a wipe or uh, alcohol uh, hand rub, or someone goes around to each of the residents to each of the or someone goes around to each of the residents to each of the tables and help them do hand hygiene prior to eating. And so it, that both the staff and the residents, and because you're just decreasing the total bio burden in your facility when you do that. And there's some great studies that show facility when you do that. And there's some great studies that show, showed um, how that decreased um, uh, uh, MRSA, uh, some different transference of, of uh, organisms because of good patient hand hygiene projects. And yes, it can be done in the in the dining their home and in your own home. You want to wash your hands before you eat. Residents should be able to do that too, and the staff that are then going to help them with feeding. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another one. How does one go about monitoring a quarterly walkthrough? But I have never asked for their cleaning record of their tables and such. Is it also our duty to provide them with um, a mounted charts container as we are the only hospital laundry that this particular facility washes? No. You, um, no. You, um, there are, you are responsible that whoever is doing your laundry for you um, does it to a hygienically clean standard. And it, you're monitoring, if you're going there and monitoring it quarterly, that's terrific. That's probably even more frequently than the standard calls for. But what I would do is there's some really nice checklists, and if you don't have one, I'd be glad to give you one uh, for to do an audit of an off-site laundry and make sure in the contract that it, it also transported back to you safely and clean, that you then audit that facility and keep that audit tool on file and make sure that you're having that open communication with them on requirements. Okay, and then there was a two-part question. Um, the other question was, is it also our duty to provide uh, them with a mounted sharps container? As we are the only hospital laundry this particular facility washes or, or uses? And no, you aren't required to... Or uses. And no, you aren't required to to give that to them, um, but they are required to meet, uh, if they're an accredited laundry, they're required to ha meet those standards. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Just an FYI, um, Storage shelves have to be 18 inches below the ceiling now and not 12 inch, inches as this was a revamp of the emergency preparedness requirement. This come from our um, Jonathan from Kansas, our QIO colleague. Um, do you clean the gate belt? I, I agree with that uh, because it should be Okay. Okay. Uh, now we're on to gate belts. Do you clean the gate belt between each resident or have a, or have a gate belt available in each resident room? Our nurses carry a gate belt with them in case of, I don't know what RSD means, um, but in case they need it in the, their hallway. You know, that, you know, that, uh, the practice of uh, too many times I see gate belts used as like a belt on people's uniform, and that grossly contaminates that belt. That's a mm -hmm. fomite that's been carried from room to room and uh, is not a good practice. Uh, I do recommend a gate belt is not a good practice. Uh, I do recommend a gate belt uh, in every room hung on a hook on the back of the wall and of the door. Uh, use a permanent marker on that belt with on that belt with the room number 
so that they can be laundered regularly and returned to that room and not with the resident name on it. Right. Then, Would you then, also agree? I mean, sorry. Have that sort of places. And then have extras that are then laundered after. Otherwise, there are new uh, ones out that are plastic that are wipeable. Okay. I know that some of our people, our homes are using um, gate belts for each um, each bed. Each each person has their own gate belt. They they label them. Um, um, have a regular washing cycle for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Crystal, have we've got? Well, I guess we're right about two o'clock. Unless Crystal, you've got some other um, questions that I might have missed at the end here. That I might have missed at the end here. Um, I don't see anything. Okay. And, and along with the gate belt top, we've got a lot of times I did ask about lift sheets also, and those should be dedicate, dedicated to the resident. The resident. Okay, we've got a comment here I just want to share um, from Aaron Carlson. We recently went to individual gate belts in our facility. Each resident has their own gate belt, and it goes with them throughout the entire facility. We saw a drastic decrease in the entire facility. We saw a drastic decrease in UTI within the first month. Awesome. Oh, that is that is a great testimony. Yeah. yeah. So with that, it's a minute after 2 o'clock, so we'll have to shut this down. But thank you so much for providing your expertise and your insight. Thanks for, I know on behalf of South Dakota, we want to just um, thank you for coming and doing those assessments. They were wonderful. We learned a lot. Um, we appreciate everybody on the call today and value your time. And